so much, Denver. Uh, so y'all can keep the questions coming in the chat. We have a few to kick us off. Uh, so we will just dive right in. Um, we have one question. Why did Washington not push to limit political parties through legislation? Why did he only warn against it? Uh, that's that's a fun question. I, I like that. I guess uh, that, that just would have been so difficult, I guess, to, to outlaw political parties totally. Um, but but yeah, I think, uh, you know, he he was so worried about them that you kind of think that he might have tried <laughs> something something like that. And Washington, you know, he loved this word and this concept of disinterestedness. And we, we think of that word today and we think, geez, that, that usually means someone's not interested. But for Washington, it meant that someone was the opposite of self-interested, that he was cared about the common good. And that's why he despised parties so much. But we're going to look at some documents in the second half uh, that, you know, I think show Washington, even Washington becoming something of a partisan by the end of his life. So, so I kind of see, you know, I, I always teach about how inevitable is the dirtiest word in history, <laughs> but I think political parties were kind of inevitable and maybe even Washington saw that. Um, I do also want to say if you want to, if any participants want to raise their hand and ask a question, uh, we can unmute you if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. That way as well. So um, great. More questions coming in. Since there isn't an instruction guide to running a country, would you say the founding fathers were oftentimes just winging it? <laughs> I love that. They were absolutely winging it. Uh, <laughs> this whole country was made by winging it. <laughs> Uh, America. America is really invented, right? America is made up. And that's what we looked at yesterday, you know, the celebration of July 4th and the Declaration of Independence. Um, they're making this all up, right? And and they did they did a pretty good job. That, you know, we've we've lasted, you know, by some measures, we have the most successful revolution in world history, maybe along with the glorious revolution of 1688 in Britain, because we still live in a society that was created by the revolution and under the frame of government that was created. And that's, and that's why we have these sessions and we spend so much time and the state of Texas makes you spend so much time teaching about the constitution and all these things um, because this is the living revolution, right? I think that's one reason our politics are so emotional and so visceral going all the way back to Jefferson and Hamilton. They're fighting over the vision of what the country will become. And in some ways we're still having that fight because we're still shaping, you know, uh, what we're calling this week, the American Revolution uh, settlement. So, so I like that. If that helps with your students, <laughs> America, just winging it. I say, <laughs> I, I say go for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. What are some of the implications of the Electoral College on democracy and popular sovereignty? How did the Electoral College come about during the Constitutional Convention? Ah, the old electoral college. Yeah, so electoral college is a great example of this, and you know, an even longer version of this talk. I would, I, would, I think that'd be good to go into detail because it it captures exactly um, how the framers didn't trust, fully trust the people. Um, you know, a, a popular vote was actually proposed at the constitutional convention uh, by James Wilson of Pennsylvania. And it had almost no support. The other sort of way to elect the president would have been the states. And as I was talking about, um, these various elites were also very nervous about states and, and state control. Um, so the electoral college is, is a weird, you might call it marriage, uh, between you know, those people that distrusted popular vote and which was most of the framers and the states uh, people who wanted some state control because you know by still electing the president by states it, it keeps some of that so it kept some of those you know what we call small staters and then New, New Jersey fine people it kept them happy so it's also we talked about winging it um, this is done at the very end of the convention <laughs> they're running out of time <laughs> They're like, oh my gosh, Constitution Day is coming up. It's almost September 17th. We got to finish. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so they throw this together and Madison admits that in his notes from the convention that it's, it was kind of a last minute thing. So I don't see the Electoral College as very sacred 
uh, in, in our founding. <laughs> All right, we've got another question from Craig. Uh, I've heard that the founding fathers and presidents ongoing viewed going into politics as like an after retired kind of thing. Uh, when did the shift happen that made it into more of a career, like career politicians? Mm. Um, was it during the dawn of the Industrial Revolution or um, what do you think? Yeah, a, a, a good question. So it's interesting. I think, I think what we might call the career politician was born quite early. Some of these guys I was talking about in my presentation, people like William Finley, um, you know, he even though he was an anti-federalist, um, he eventually gets elected to Congress uh, from Pennsylvania, serves for the rest of his life, basically, becomes known as the Venerable Finley because he served in the House for so long. Um, and, and so it, it's interesting, but it, it, it was among common people like him that politics was seen as more of a possible career. It was more people that had independent means, some wealth, that they kind of saw it as a temporary thing. Um, and that's one reason why that amendment about the pay raise, we might, we might ask, why, why didn't that pass originally? It just seems kind of logical that Congress can't give itself a raise without another election. Well, one reason that didn't pass originally is that this was a hot button issue of that era. And a lot of common people argued for larger salaries for politicians so that they could participate so they could afford to participate. Uh, so it wasn't just elites. Uh, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept, uh, this idea of the independent politician. And so good question. Yeah. Kelly says, I have recently read that the founders wrote and based the constitution on ideals they themselves could not live up to, but wanted us to strive to be better. How much of that is true? Well, I do love it. I love the first, the opening line, you know, to form a more perfect union. Uh, that's such a great line that, you know, it doesn't say to create a perfect union, and this would be a work in progress. And I would say one thing that the, the framers did that uh, has been beneficial is the amendment process. Um, the Articles of Confederation, as I mentioned, required all 13 states to change it. And, and so the Constitution created an easier process even though today I think we see it as pretty difficult. You know, it's hard to imagine almost anything that two thirds of Congress and three fourths of the states can agree to. But I think the premise of that question is right, that the, the framers, you know, wanted to make it easier to fix uh, the constitution. And, and so that's happened 27 times. Um, and uh, we'll, see, we'll see which one is next. It's been a long time since we've had a amendment of real, real consequence. I mean, that goes all the way back to 1972 with the 26th Amendment allowing 18-year-olds to vote. All right, we have a broad question uh, from Morrissey. Do you have any thoughts on how Madison moved from one of the most outspoken Federalists who pushed for federal power in the convention to a Democratic Republican? Yeah, great, great question. So, in, in the, the historiography, in the literature, the historical literature, this is called the Madison problem. So you've hit upon the Madison problem. Why does Madison shift uh, from you know, being partnered with Alexander Hamilton in creating the constitution and being a federalist and then partnering with Jefferson and, and, and becoming a, a democratic Republican? And I will say, you know, I think the consensus in the literature, which I tend to agree with, is that Madison doesn't change as much as he thinks Hamilton did. So I don't think Madison or Jefferson or maybe anybody was really prepared for the ambition of Alexander Hamilton's economic proposals. Um, I mean, just think about this. This is the start of a new government, the start of a new presidential administration. And you might kind of think that the way to go would be to kind of play it safe and, you know, it had been very divisive creating this government, but, Matt, but uh, Hamilton comes in with that big economic program. And I think Madison was like, whoa, whoa, this is not quite what I had in mind. Um, and, you know, I think Jefferson is also a big influence on him. We have to remember Jefferson was in France uh, during the whole time the constitution was being created. 
So he's not really, he's sometimes listed as an anti-federalist. I don't think that's correct. He just wasn't around. He wasn't around for that debate, but he comes back and he's also nervous about Hamilton's uh, proposals. All right, we've got uh, Cindy saying, political parties have changed American politics tremendously. Do you think the founding fathers expected them to disappear or do you think they felt they were necessary? Yeah, so I, um, again, I think one of the biggest oversights of the constitution is not anticipating political parties. So they were so worried about balancing the power between the legislative branch, and the judicial branch and the executive branch, that they, they didn't really think of a world in which the executive branch and the legislative branch might come under the control of say the same party um, or even be different parties and how dysfunctional that might be. They just didn't really think about it. Um, and so once they finally do create political parties, you know, once the Democratic Republicans and Federalists form, when Jefferson and Madison start that opposition to the Federalists, they do say uh, that they still say parties are bad, um, but sometimes they're necessary when there's a crisis. And they thought Hamilton's economic program was a crisis. Uh, so they were called for. And their ultimate goal was for them to go away again. <laughs> they, they wanted to defeat the Federalists and then have it go away. So when Jefferson becomes president, in his inaugural speech, he very famously says, you know, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. I think one way to read those words is he's saying, we are all Republicans, we are all Republicans. <laughs> In other words, he wanted the Federalists to disappear off the face of the earth. And, and so what we have today when it's working well is a functional party system. And for that to work, the opposition has to recognize the right of the other side to exist. This is a concept that's known as the loyal opposition. And I think that's one reason our politics are in a really bad place right now. We don't seem to have that. It, you know, we, we're kind of going back to the days, of the early days of the Republic in which each side is just trying to annihilate the other. All right, let's do one last question before we take a break. Craig says that, uh, I know when they created the constitution, the framers wanted to do it in secret so as not to start a riot among the states. Do you think though that if the common man would have, that if it had been known, would the common man have agreed? Um, it's kind of a what if question, but we hear that our founding fathers did not feel the public was educated enough to truly involve themselves. Can you say more about that? Yeah, what a fun question. And I love what if questions, you know, historians make everything complicated. What if questions are called counterfactuals. <laughs> I love your counterfactual. Uh, and I absolutely believe if it had not been secret, if they hadn't closed the windows and the shades and you know, everything else, um, I think there would have been an uproar about what was happening. This was a complete transformation of the government. And there was, there was whispers of what was taking place, but the delegates were you know, incredibly confidential and secret about what was happening. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I don't know if it, they would have been able to pull it off. So, so a lot of these things we kind of can look at in a couple different ways. Uh, in some ways, this was kind of like a coup. The Constitution <laughs> was like a bloodless coup. But at the same time, it's worked out really well. So this is a complicated thing to teach students. You know, that, you know, this is a document that, in many ways, as I said, was intended to limit democracy. That today, and I do want to stress that today, I think it is a safeguard of democracy, but only because of all those amendments I mentioned at the end. Uh, so... Um, you know, these are tough issues and that's why we, we need all of you on the front lines. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I said that was the last question, but we're gonna do one more. Uh, Melvin says, can you expand on the idea of the tyranny of the majority? Is this a critique of utilitarianism? Yeah, so the, the tyranny of the majority, it's not a critique of utilitarianism, which is an idea that comes a little bit later um, in the 19th century, but I guess it, it could be, um, you, could, you could, you might think about it that way. Um, and so this is, this is something that um, the phrase Adams says it, it's his words, but it's an idea that I think Madison really shared in the most. And that is in a representative government, uh, there have to be rules to prevent the same people uh, just 
ruling all the time uh, and getting their way. And, and so the United States is unique in this respect. It's really difficult to pass a law in the United States, even in the best of times. Uh, and this is by design. So we have a certain amount of gridlock built into the system, whereas you know, European parliamentary system, you can go from socialism to capitalism, <laughs> back to socialism, you know, pretty much overnight. It, it's much slower in the US. And that is part of because of Madison trying to prevent you know, that tyranny of the majority. So if you have students who are ready to move to Canada, which is kind of far from Texas, I realize, maybe it'd be more likely to go to Mexico. Uh, <laughs> uh, if they're not happy with whoever's being elected president, you know, what I tell my students is, uh, you know, don't worry, Madison, Madison has your back. Um, it's pretty hard. And we see this with the Biden administration right now. It's pretty hard to come into office and do very much very quickly just because of the way the system is set up. All right. Well, great questions, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to.